back, and I know you're all excited about it. So we are up to uh, centralization of political power, uh, uh, kind of in theory, uh, how to turn sort of many political parts into one. You can see from the very simple chart there, decentralized power, which means not centralized, is when you have sort of a number of different uh, political entities, all sovereign, you know, independent of each other, and on the left uh, is uh, centralization, which generally means sort of taking uh, uh, a system, a nation, a people uh, away from decentralized power uh, and imposing uh, one structure of government over them and forcing them uh, into, into your role. So from many, right, on the right, you see five different, uh, say, governments there. That's what that's supposed to represent. Uh, and now you have one. Usually, the way it happens, you're probably not surprised, is a king where a leader comes along and tells the others, "Hey, you're gonna, you're gonna now function under my uh, uh, rule and command. You can still stay a powerful dude in your little neck of the woods there, but I'm gonna be the, uh, you know, the sort of the big dog uh, in the in the area." So we're gonna look at first of all why centralize at all. Uh, what's the point? Uh, well, there are costs and benefits both then and now. Though, again, centralized nation-states are the uh, form of political organization at the national, international level. It's already attested to. Uh, nonetheless, there have always been uh, benefits and costs. I don't have time to run down all these. We could sort of do a whole semester on, on this, uh, but and, and we won't. Uh, as far as benefits are concerned, I, I think it is safe to say that uh, the modern countries of the world today at least the ones that have become, you know, rich and powerful, or even you know, relatively rich and powerful, uh, probably couldn't have gotten to that state uh, without centralizing power. Uh, so it doesn't mean things are always better uh, under centralization. Sometimes what it means is that it's, you know, it, maybe it's not pretty uh, to live in a centralized nation state, but if we hadn't centralized we would have been conquered by somebody else and maybe uh, somebody that like enslaved us or made life worse for us because they didn't care about us because they were from a foreign country and they looked down on us. So sometimes centralization seems to be the only choice for survival. Remember back to that idea of uh, cultural evolution. Uh, th this type of system competed well uh, uh, in uh, you know the international uh, you know uh, climate. The, 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 in, the, a world of international and national uh, you know, ethnic conflict. So uh, the one of the benefits is you don't get taken over as easily if you centralize. Another one is you can mobilize uh, or even sort of harness more resources and, and sort of uh, grow a bigger economy. Uh, so uh, economic advance, technological advance, standard of living uh, tends to go up uh, quicker and, and more. Uh, in a centralized, uh, you know, polity, centralized uh, governing system rather than decentralized. So uh, centralization uh, has its benefits. On the cost side of it, uh, sometimes government can uh, become too powerful. Uh, you know, what uh, Locke uh, had worried about, we saw in the last segment, and run roughshod then over the rights of individuals uh, and to uh, you know, turn tyrannical and become uh, you know, deeply unjust. The more centralized it is, generally speaking, the more powerful it is. Uh, centralized uh, government can also become so depersonalized uh, that it's sort of hard to deal with and uh, uh, sometimes obnoxious to deal with. Uh, so uh, certainly there are sometimes are benefits to decentralization. Uh, I think uh, community life uh, tends to be more vibrant uh, and, uh, you know, neighbors knowing each other and people going to church and involved in clubs and this kind of thing uh, in decentralized systems of government and power throughout history. There are some even now. Our political system in the U.S., though this is in a class on that, is, of course, a combination of centralization and decentralization. Our federal government or our federalist system is designed so that the the central or national government has some of the power, but some of the power is, uh, and this is written into the Constitution all the way back to 1787, uh, the, the, the states retain certain specific powers, 
uh, and anything that the federal government is not uh, uh, given, granted the authority to do by the Constitution is supposed to be left to the states, and the same for uh, localities like cities, uh, you know, city city governments. So our system is, is supposed to be, anyway, uh, by constitutional authority, uh, part centralized and part decentralized, which makes it uh, extra fascinating to study our system. But that wasn't happening here. Pretty much, we're moving from decentralization in 17th century Europe to centralization, or at least the effort to do so, those that failed uh, uh, to do so tended to be in trouble in terms of being able to compete militarily, economically, uh, and so forth uh, with their neighbors that could, that were centralized. So the six fundamentals of political centralization, legitimacy, uh, number one. Uh, I'm not saying that I can tell you for sure that all six of these heads have to be in place for a centralized system to form, uh, uh, you know, in the first place, or for it to succeed and survive. Uh, but I can say is that the more of these uh, that a government has, more of the time, the greater the likelihood that it's going to survive, uh, uh, succeed, survive, thrive. Uh, at the top of our list is legitimacy. Any government has to work at, to some degree, to legitimize itself. Some do so better than others. Some have to sort of work harder at it than others, depending on various circumstances, time and place and beliefs and technology and all kinds of things. So what does legitimacy mean? It means you have to be able to convince the people, that you, your people that you're ruling, that you're a legitimate ruler. That you're not just some sort of, you know, uh, ruffian that sort of came in and sort of said, hey, follow my uh, uh, orders. Well, why? Uh, we have to tell them why. Uh, even if you've come in by brute force and you're, uh, you know, holding power just by force or the threat of force, you still, for the most part, are wise uh, to do to make some effort at uh, legitimizing yourself. It's just easier. Uh, you can rule by force and threat of force, but uh, if you can do less of that, it saves time and money and effort. Uh, if you can just get the people to accept that you're the leader except, you know, the government uh, that, that is. But you need to work at it uh, uh, somehow uh, uh, if you're likely to be successful. And there's various ways to legitimize. You have to tell them stories. Uh, they don't have to even be true. As long as the public buys the story, uh, you know, as to why you, uh, your government, your family, you know, should rule, uh, then it works. It sort of helps to sort of keep everybody kind of, you know, on the same page, the society glued together. Legitimacy of the, of, the, of the utmost importance. In our period here, acquiescence of the nobility uh, is a major feature of political centralization. Uh, this is to say that it's the nobility that's the biggest stumbling block uh, always uh, to centralization of power. See on the, on the right those five little guys that are part of the decentralized system? Uh, those are, say, those are regions of France. They're not, but might as well be. So those are reasons, and those are like dukes who rule their own little duchies, their own little province of France uh, on on their own. They're nobles, and they don't usually like to give up their power uh, to somebody uh, higher than them, because uh, in many places like France and others in Europe, they were used to for a long time, as their fathers and grandfathers uh, were, uh, sort of wielding ultimate authority uh, over their area, just as you know, not a national area, but a uh, a kind of a sub-national area. So they're not always wild about the king over here in the orange and the left in the middle, bowling pin in the middle, uh, coming along and saying, hey, all five of you guys, uh, now you're under my control. Uh, so uh, it's the nobility getting them to heal, to acquiesce. Uh, they don't have to love you. They just have to sort of tolerate you. Uh, and, you and there are various ways to do this. You can sort of buy them off. You can give them sort of lots of rewards. Uh, one king uh, in the 18th century, we'll talk about it another time, uh, after the Thirty Years' War had destroyed uh, Germany, uh, a lot of the German dukes and nobility in the area had huge debts because their land was destroyed by the war. Uh, and the king smartly uh, uh, said, I, I can loan you guys some money uh, if you do this uh, or that. Uh, all of the ifs were if you, you know, in a, in a sense, sign over authority to me. Uh, sometimes kings uh, set up systems uh, that reward nobles who cooperate. In Russia, for instance, uh, the table of ranks 
uh, was the czar's uh, uh, sort of w uh, way of uh, making a hierarchy in society in a very organized way and uh, telling people, hey, you can sort of uh, compete with each other for glory uh, and for honor uh, uh, you know, from the state, from the czar, from you know your, your country, if you move higher and higher uh, on this, uh, uh, these ranks, move from you know middle or lower to uh, the highest ranks possible, and you'll get you'll be bathed in glory, and uh, you know everyone will love you, have all kinds of perks and success and fame and fortune, and so that's a sense in a sense buying them off, getting them to uh, uh, giving them rewards if they play along with your uh, leadership and rule. Third. All successful governments, really, at least over the long haul, have to have a monopoly of force. You can't allow somebody else to have a private army in your own country running around uh, and making mischief, or even, you know, you know, potentially making mischief. You, 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 you just, uh, you, you can't allow it to, to go on, and, and none of these states do uh, at this time uh, or after. It's also important. There's another fundamental of centralization. To have efficient professional administration and bureaucracy, uh, we already kind of at least touched on the importance of, uh, or uh, you know, how uh, bureaucracy is a major part of modern government, uh, and you can't centralize if you, if you're not organized. Right? We're talking about sometimes millions of people now being organized into one political system. That takes some doing. Uh, among other things, it takes organizational ability. Uh, it helps if you've got educated, trained administrators and bureaucrats sort of working in a system that's already, uh, uh, you know, put together in a systematic way, usually a top-down system with, you know, bosses in certain departments and sort of everybody knows where they are in the chain of command. They know what their job is, uh, you know, in sort of the larger whole. Uh, uh, so uh, as uh, the, the need for centralized government grows, or at least the perceived need for it grows, a lot more thought and effort goes into uh, organization uh, and creating and designing uh, effective, uh, you know, efficient administrative and bureaucratic systems. You need, as part of that, so four and five do kind of overlap, uh, certainly, uh, especially effective fiscal policy. You need to build a tax effectively. It also helps if you can borrow effectively as a government. So uh, this uh, ends up being crucial too. Uh, and in the 17th century and into the 18th and beyond as well, the most important reason uh, that you need to have sort of good fiscal policy uh, and be able to uh, you know, effectively raise taxes uh, through a, an effective tax administration and bureaucracy is because of the needs of war. Uh, war was expensive, and we'll see that the Europeans were going to war with each other uh, and others all the time. Uh, so uh, you better have an effective or effective means of uh, getting together uh, pooling cash uh, because warfare was uh, becoming uh, increasingly increasingly expensive. You also needed to, uh, right, as a fundamental of centralization, shift people's loyalty uh, to the nation state or to you as the king, as the leader of the nation state. Uh, so, uh, and this wasn't easy to do at this time. Seventeenth century was a, t a period where people were still used to having their ultimate loyalty to that duke over there on the right, uh, and not to a king. They were uh, also, if there's a Catholic country, used to uh, giving uh, at least much of their loyalty or most of it to the Pope in Rome as a loyal Catholic. Uh, and so kings have come along and realized, okay, this is not going to be that easy. Some of these uh, people, most of them, uh, have deep ties. Uh, you know, emotional and, and you know, uh, very uh, deeply felt ties to the Catholic Church, the Pope, uh, to the, their local nobles, uh, and I'm going to have to really work uh, to uh, you know, sort of wrest loyalty uh, away from those other two sources primarily uh, to me. Now, again, that could be done in a lot of ways, uh, and it takes sort of a, 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 you know, a long period of time, but more or less the it's pulled off. Part of it's through propaganda, um, part of it's through you know propaganda that uh, emphasizes patriotism and loyalty to the state. Again, giving out rewards 
for loyalty, you know, honor, glory, uh, for battlefield heroics, and uh, these kind of things uh, that sort of make. We'll see an example of this sort of make the king making himself look, uh, you know, grand and intimidating, godlike, uh, awe-inspiring. Uh, those things uh, can uh, uh, and did work sometimes uh, as well. We're going to look at a number of the. Uh, countries of Europe uh, that were in the process of at least attempting to centralize. Uh, and we're going to start with the five great powers of Europe, which you can see here. And we're going to start with these because these are the five dominant countries, kingdoms, uh, th throughout most of our class, meaning the time period we're studying from the 17th century into the mid 20th century. These are going to be uh, consistently the top five. Uh, they're not in necessarily uh, order right there, uh, but one could argue that Great Britain, for much of the period we're going to stu uh, study, uh, deserves kind of the number one ranking, uh, but they're not really in order. So uh, England, which does become Great Britain, name eventually, so same thing. France, Germany, which when we first take a look at them will be only part of Germany, uh, the state of Prussia, but it went on to become the dominant force uh, in German politics, and eventually it was Prussia that unified uh, what we now call Germany into one country when it had been before hundreds and then dozens of separate little and medium-sized, uh, small-sized countries separate. Uh, in that 30 years war that I already mentioned, there was no one Germany. There were many, many, many of them. Prussia was just one of the bigger states in Germany, uh, but certainly not the only one. Austria is also a German state, German-speaking uh, rulers in the Habsburg family and dynasty who owned a huge chunk of Europe. Uh, they're a good example of kind of the old uh, hereditary uh, monarchy, hereditary kind of dynasty, uh, where a lot of their lands were owned uh, non-contiguously, meaning not ne right next to each other, based on uh, inheritance patterns, intermarriages of other royal families, and the laws uh, about that. Uh, and so uh, they were quite strategic uh, in the marriage alliances they made uh, and in actually marrying their uh, relatives together. Uh, yes, uh, incest. Uh, the Habsburgs became known, some of you might already know this because it's so famous, but they became known in time uh, for having all kinds of uh, medical uh, health problems, mental problems, physical problems that were uh, the product of uh, uh, intermarriage. They wanted to keep the uh, basically the land as much in their hands as possible, so they favored uh, marrying uh, you know closer relatives than you actually should. You know, at some point out, I don't know exactly where it is. Uh, I'm not an expert on this, but. Uh, at some point, you know, out, you could marry relatives at least uh, and not cause physical, you know, biological problems. Uh, whether or not it would still be, uh, you know, uh, okay to do so is, you know, culturally is something else. Uh, and it, it depends on the culture. Uh, but no, nonetheless, the Habsburgs were marrying uh, off their offspring, uh, uh, you know, uh, so close together in terms of how closely they're related that it caused them problems. Uh, physically, mentally, uh, some of them became kings uh, and couldn't even function uh, as kings because of the uh, their uh, disabilities, be because of uh, intermarriage. But Austria is one of the five uh, great powers. The Austrian home, the Habsburg homelands, and if you see in the little little map there, uh, is the whole uh, light blue area there, which is a pretty big chunk of real estate uh, in in Europe. And if you look just to the uh, south of that, the, the boot of Italy, uh, Italy shaped like a boot uh, out into the Mediterranean Sea, uh, that, that's the size of Italy beneath it and Austria uh, above it. It's a, it's a large chunk of territory. Russia is the fifth uh, of the five great powers of Europe, so we will have uh, a cause to talk about uh, one and all of these, and oftentimes their interrelations uh, uh, with each other in unit after unit after unit in this class. For instance, when World War I starts out, who are the five most important and powerful combatants? Those five. Uh, and so World War I, it's, uh, the other smaller countries get involved too. But the most important thing to know uh, in terms of who's fighting who is it was great, that it was Great Britain, France, and Russia. 
against Germany and Austria. Uh, uh, it was known as Austria-Hungary by then. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, so the five main power, uh, great powers were still the same. So, uh, again, we're going to talk about Britain and France in this very unit uh, extensively. Well, not so much Germany, Austria, and Russia, but they're going to come up a lot later on. In the meantime, uh, we're going to talk about some of the others. As I say here, right, the rise and fall of European countries, kingdoms, nation-states, uh, and uh, sort of the uh, problem of contingency, conjuncture, the limits of nature. Uh, we're going to look at sort of the might-have-beens, ha uh, uh, has-beens of uh, European history. Th that is to say that it, it wasn't destiny, uh, it wasn't set in stone that these five powers here would be the dominant ones in Europe. We tend to think of history that way because we know how it turned out in the past, because it, it's in the past, it's already you know, etched in stone. We tend to easily get sort of misled into thinking it had to happen that way. But uh, almost all historians don't uh, uh, you know, think that, that history isn't inevitable. There may be certain events that could be inevitable, but uh, it's, it's, it's not much of the time. So uh, this is, I think, a good lesson in how things may have turned out differently had certain factors uh, changed. It's not always e easy to know, uh, you know, which factors, uh, you know, might explain one country rising or falling kind of out of the mix. When we meet uh, these five countries, we're going to see right away that right at the beginning uh, of, you know, right around the 17th century, there are a couple others that actually could be seen to be in that list of five, one of these taken out. Uh, I just put the five that are going to be most consistently there. But at first, there are actually a couple others that may deserve top five status. At the bottom right, I talk about the explanatory power of the competitive European state system. Uh, and this does have a lot of explanatory power. Uh, it'll come back in a number of units uh, because it helps to explain much, not all, but much uh, of what happens in Europe in, the, in this time period, these uh, few hundred years we'll be talking about. So uh, how and why? Well, Europe is a peninsula, really. Uh, it's called a continent, but in some ways it's a small peninsula kind of jutting out uh, sort of off of the west of the Asian landmass. Sometimes it's called Eurasia now because it's connected. Uh, those two uh, you know, uh, continents are connected to each other. So you look at the just that map right there, it's kind of confusing and crazy. And that's a lot of medium-sized, small-sized countries, except for Russia, which is gigantic uh, up to the upper right there, but sort of jammed close together on this Again, relatively speaking, small peninsula, uh, which makes it then likely that there's going to be lots of conflict. Lots of countries around, there's lots of flashpoints. You know, if you just said sort of two countries in this whole landmass, well, okay, there could be a war between them. But as long as those two countries are getting along, you're okay. But when you've got many of them abutting each other and surrounding each other, uh, there's much greater likelihood of con conflict just based on the numbers alone. Uh, that, plus the fact that they're so close uh, that they can never be certain what their neighbors are up to, even if they're allies and you know, peace treaties with them. How do we know that they're not you know, preparing to attack us? Uh, so there's huge competition. Uh, there might have been anyway, but because there's so many states roughly the same size, packed so closely together, it forces them all uh, to try to s sort of stick, keep up with and s or even s go ahead of their neighbors militarily, technologically, culturally, uh, scientifically, uh, etc., etc. So this will help explain the arms race, uh, the, uh, the fact that Europe developed weapons that uh, eventually became the dominant weapons, uh, uh, in, you know, in the whole world. Uh, this is what explains it. The Europeans weren't smarter than anybody else. They just uh, happened to, you know, to nobody's design, this just happened uh, without anybody planning it, but this happened to live in an area where the competition was severe uh, because of the way it's laid out, as you see right here, and so they had no choice, or felt they had no choice, but to keep sort of perfecting and uh, working at improving our weapons. Why? Because if we don't, our neighbors will, uh, or we know they are. Uh, so this kind of became non-stop uh, progress, technologically and otherwise, and so the European state system, as competitive as it was, uh, laid out uh, in the geography here uh, as it was, uh, explains a great deal about Europe's 
uh, rise in terms of its power uh, in many ways. So let's start uh, with the Portuguese. These are one of the might have beens, could have beens, has beens. Uh, in fact, in the previous century, uh, we're starting in the 17th, but in the previous century, the Portuguese carved out a gigantic empire uh, that spread from Portugal. You see the ship there, Lisbon is the capital of Portugal, all the way around the southern tip of Africa uh, into the Persian Gulf, uh, on to India, uh, beyond to the Malaccan Straits, uh, all the way to China. Uh, uh, and so this is a maritime empire, uh, which meant that they did it by uh, you know, plying the oceans. They were the leading seafaring nation in Europe in the uh, 16th century, meaning they put more money <coughs> into bigger and better, more high-tech ships and more voyages and uh, more effort to uh, get you know, further uh, away in explorations uh, and colonizing than any other European country. And the results showed, because Europe is a, or, uh, Lisbon is a, a small country, uh, and uh, uh, Lisbon. And Portugal's a small country. Lisbon's a city. Uh, losing my mind. Uh, so that's a sprawling empire uh, for one uh, small country. But they got the lead. That helped. Uh, they didn't hold it for very long uh, because the other countries around them, Spain included, just right around them, uh, eventually overtook them. Uh, so uh, Portugal collapsed in terms of its power only stayed sort of near the top for a short amount of time, mainly, I think, just because of something simple, its small size, not enough population uh, uh, to really compete militarily, economically, not enough territory to compete uh, you know, economically either. But all the little green dots are places that they uh, established trading posts, established control over, uh, built forts, uh, controlled uh, ports, took them over by force, brutal, bloody force. Uh, so uh, it was a sprawling empire, but it didn't go inland. The, the, the Portuguese weren't interested in, it's probably wise because it would have been extremely difficult to do, uh, but uh, they just sort of stuck to the uh, uh, coastline areas. All they really wanted, those dot areas for those cities and ports, uh, was to refuel their ships, uh, to uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, protect them uh, uh, in their routes to and from the spice islands of Indonesia and uh, on their way to you know, uh, trade for Chinese silk, etc., etc. So it was a maritime uh, and commercial empire, though the Portuguese were trying to spread uh, Christianity uh, or uh, uh, Catholic Christianity, uh, like all the other European countries were trying to spread Christianity to other parts of the world as well. But because uh, of the empire they carved out, uh, they certainly are sort of near the top, uh, at least in the previous century. By the time we get to them in the 17th century, they've already been passed up by most of the other, uh, at least the top five we're talking about, and, and some of the others. Spain, uh, not only were they in the top five in the previous century, uh, they were unarguably the number one power in Europe, maybe the world, in the 17th or the 16th century. If you look at this little simple global map here, uh, that's a pretty large chunk of uh, territory, meaning a large chunk of the world in this case. Most of their empire, of course, was in the New World uh, in North and South America. You see most of the red splotches there, Mexico, Florida, Central America, uh, Peru into South America, but uh, still uh, holdings in uh, uh, the East Indies as well. Uh, the Philippines uh, primarily, uh, against Spain and other parts of Europe, parts of West Africa as well. So uh, Spain, m uh, mainly because of this empire in the New World, on the left-hand side of the map, uh, and more specifically than that, the huge amounts of gold and silver they extracted, one could say stole, from Native Americans and brought back to Europe and Spain uh, is the main thing that made them the dominant power in Europe in the 16th century. They did uh, squander much of that uh, uh, wealth, partly by fighting too many wars against other European powers, uh, or war again is getting extremely expensive. So Spain probably could have and should have stayed in the top five, uh, one of the, you know, remained one of the great powers for longer, but the Spanish kings at the time, Charles V, his son Philip II, made uh, some pretty poor decisions. Uh, uh, with the, the you know with regard to the huge amount of money that they were bringing into the Spanish coffers 
mainly from again the new world uh, on many of these you've already seen I'm not going to read a word for word most of that is for you to be able to go back and study uh, on your on your own uh, to give you more sources uh, to some of them are Perry as you see but some of them are not uh, to be able to understand this stuff uh, better the Dutch Republic this is an astonishing uh, uh, case uh, in the 17th century again where we pick things up the Dutch are in there they're probably like number three or something maybe uh, you know uh, Prussia uh, probably Prussia would be the one that wouldn't be uh, there so again I you know I I had, to, I had to pick the five that were the dominant ones. They usually talk about these as the five major powers of Europe, the five that we've designated, but you know, history and time doesn't stand still, so it's a bit more fluid than that. So it's not quite that simple. The Dutch Republic is a good example of this. Uh, this is a tiny country, right? Uh, Holland today. Uh, Amsterdam is its capital, uh, and it was uh, noteworthy in a number of respects. Number one, it was a republic already. So uh, a system of government uh, that wasn't a monarchy, though they were taking steps to uh, attempt to centralize, uh, but in a, a slightly different way, uh, a unique way. Uh, so there weren't that many republics breaking out in the world in the 17th century. Uh, so uh, this is a, an incredibly noteworthy development. Right? Our system of government is at least technically a republic. I mean, in many ways, it's actually a republic. So uh, the Dutch weren't uh, being ruled at this time by a king, absolute or constitutional. Uh, they were mainly being governed by uh, the uh, a, uh, oligarchy uh, right, of rich merchants. Uh, and this leads us to the second uh, astonishing feature of Dutch uh, life and society at the time. Uh, these guys became sort of the ultimate traders and businessmen, capitalists. This tiny little country that just did enormous amounts of business for uh, a, a big chunk of this century they were doing uh, the overall majority of the carrying trade in Europe which meant they were the ones who shipped everything uh, what do you mean uh, you mean you mean their products no theirs and every, all other products they were kind of like the you know uh, I don't know the UPS uh, of uh, Europe at the time if you got something you want to take overseas uh, we'll carry it for you for a price uh, they just had more ships than everybody else uh, and were better organized. Uh, and so they uh, sort of had a monopoly for a time uh, on the, the, the what they call the carrying trade, carrying goods uh, to and fro. So they built a huge fleet of merchant ships, 16,000 vessels, uh, which is about half of the European total at the time. M the Amsterdam merchants became famous in some ways uh, villainized because they couldn't uh, others couldn't compete with them uh, they could undersell everybody else <coughs> in capitalism you generally want to undersell your opponent that sometimes sounds counterintuitive uh, what do you mean you want to undersell you want to sell your product for less than your competitors why would I sell less I'll make less money no you won't because you'll get all of their customers and you'll make more in the end Right? If you put your prices lower than your competitors, your, the other merchants or producers around you, business uh, businesses around you, if your product is cheaper, everyone's going to come to you. So uh, it's kind of the Walmart principle. Why do we go to Walmart? Because they have great stuff? No, because they have lots of cheap shit and everybody goes there. And they're, they make billions because of it. That's kind of like the model. This is what the Dutch were doing in the 17th century. They were able to undersell everybody. Uh, partly because they purchased things, uh, different products that then they carried to and from and sold, you know, picked up here and sold there in other people's countries, uh, by buying in huge volume. Uh, and uh, the advantage of volume allowed them to kind of undersell. Uh, as it says here from uh, which source? Richard Dunn, The Age of Religious Wars. Uh, it says uh, nobody could undersell, undersell the Amsterdam merchants because they dealt in volume. They would sail a fleet into the Baltic, Baltic Sea in the uh, north uh, of Europe, laden with herring, fish, uh, and return with all of the grain surplus from a Danish island, or 20,000 head of lean cattle. They would buy a standing forest in Norway for timber, or contract before the grapes were harvested for the vintage of a whole French district. So they would just buy enormous amounts of things, partly because they had the money. Uh, they also... Uh, 
revolutionized banking, on insurance, uh, bills of exchange, uh, credit, uh, the, the idea of uh, fractional reserve banking. Uh, so this is an incredibly powerful uh, kingdom or republic uh, built primarily around trade and uh, wealth, economic success. They, they fought in wars. They, they fought uh, the much bigger France. Uh, to a standstill through much of this uh, century, which is amazing because France is a much bigger, much more populous country. Nonetheless, like Portugal, uh, uh, it might have been inevitable. I said history isn't inevitable, but some things uh, probably are. The Dutch uh, were always up against it just because of the small size of the country. Uh, but again, what's remarkable is considering how small they were, it's amazing they were able to break into one of the, you know, the, become one of the top powers uh, economically, politically, even militarily in the world, uh, even though it was short-lived, didn't last really beyond this century. They got beat in three successive wars against the English, the Anglo-Dutch wars. Actually, they won one of those wars, but overall they lost. And from that point forward, the English basically superseded them, and the English became the major merchants and traders uh, and businessmen uh, of the European world. The Swedish Empire. The Swedish uh, had a, a chance to make a bid, uh, and did, uh, for power. They had the advantage of having two military geniuses uh, within a century of each other as their kings, which is just kind of like genetic luck. Uh, so uh, they uh, were partly relevant uh, in terms of power uh, because of that. Uh, so uh, the their power, however, waned uh, by... 1709, the Battle of Poltava, which we'll look at in another unit uh, more specifically in more detail. But Poltava was a, a loss to the Russians. And so Russia's rise uh, happens kind of partially because of Sweden's fall in a war they fought with each other, known as the Great Northern War, that Russia eventually won. So uh, Russia, as sort of the big kid on the block in that region, uh, was starting to flex its muscles, uh, and Sweden, uh, uh, you know, didn't, uh, couldn't hold up. Even though uh, those two kings, uh, Gustavus Adolphus uh, and Charles the Twelfth, were military geniuses, great military leaders. Denmark, Norway were linked at one time. Now we know them as two separate countries. They also kind of had the same trajectory. Uh, these are might have been uh, powers, uh, meaning you know top five, the, you know, the big five powers, uh, great powers, but uh, they also kind of were in, in a region that put them uh, in competition with other up-and-comers, also, again, particularly Russia. Poland uh, was a gigantic uh, kingdom. You can see the uh, map there. If you don't know your European geography, this won't help. But uh, that is a big chunk of Central Europe right there. So a very extensive kingdom indeed. Uh, so they had lots of uh, human and natural resources, large population size. But they played a, an undersized uh, European-wide and international role. Uh, by the 18th century, as Professor Dunn says, the Polar state completely collapsed. In this case, uh, there were sort of political, social problems at home that got in the way. The, this is a good example of a kingdom that tried to centralize, or at least some in the kingdom tried to centralize it, uh, but the kings couldn't hold on. They weren't able to do one of the six major uh, uh, sort of requirements for centralization we just mentioned, and that is to uh, get the nobility to acquiesce. The nobility didn't stand down. They weren't able to convince them, make deals with them, force them to stand down. And so Poland basically remained decentralized, and they paid the costs for it, uh, which uh, meant that from this point forward, uh, in the time period that the rest of our class covers, Poland will be getting overrun by one neighbor or country after another, uh, sliced and diced up between them, partitioned, where other powers say, okay, you can take this part of Poland, we'll take that part of Poland, etc. So as attractive as decentralization of power can be in many ways, this is maybe our most outstanding example of that point that I made earlier, that sometimes if you don't centralize, 
you know, uh, you know, you don't want to, uh, uh, but you, you know, if you don't, you're going to go under, uh, and this is exactly what happened to, to Poland. The Ottoman Empire. Technically, this isn't a European empire because the Ottoman Turks uh, were a Muslim group originally from Turkey, just outside of Europe. But as you can see from the map, all the areas in different shades of green were at one point or another a part of the mighty Ottoman Empire at the time, the largest Muslim empire in the entire world. The reason this kind of still fits as a European power, <coughs> the Ottoman Empire that is, is because they did hold and control European territory uh, at one time or another, as you can see. Substantial amounts of territory, uh, mind you. However, uh, we're going to see them sort of uh, uh, fall, not quickly, by the, by the time we get to the 19th century in this class, Europeans uh, will have taken to calling the Ottoman Empire the sick man of Europe. The sick man of Europe, meaning that, that you know, it was like they were... They were saying you know, the Ottoman Empire is like a, you know, sort of a sick old man, you know, just sort of feeble and not able to you know, sort of you know, defend itself. <coughs> it's, excuse me, I'm having an issue here. Uh, but so uh, the Ottoman Empire, though, it, in the 17th century was still powerful and still caused a, a great deal of concern and worry. Uh, Europeans at, at various times, even before the 17th century, thought that they might go under to the Ottoman Empire. That, the, that, that all of Europe, or at least you know, bigger parts of it, would be overrun permanently. The Ottomans laid siege to Vienna, Austria, Habsburg uh, capital, uh, on two different occasions, and almost took uh, you know, what was one of the great European uh, capitals of the uh, you know, of the continent. So uh, the Ottomans uh, also were kind of right there, uh, uh, threatening to. You know, sort of break in as one of the, if not the, uh, leading power in Europe. In this case, from outside of Europe. We're going to look at, from this point forward, uh, get into uh, kind of a compare and contrast in the third and fourth parts of our lecture between uh, France and uh, England and their political development in the 17th century. <clears throat> Again, excuse me, in France, it's royal absolutism. Uh, forget the patrimonial part. We won't talk about that. But uh, France does uh, create a successful centralized absolute monarchy. So I said there were different ways to centralize. Uh, one of them is absolute monarchy, which uh, we know means power in the hands of the king, uh, and he doesn't share it with any other institution. That doesn't mean no one else has any influence. He has to have advisors, and there are sometimes other... Uh, uh, elements of government that have some power, but in an absolutist system, the king calls most of the shots, and he doesn't really have any uh, really institutionalized rivals. In the French system, uh, they were basically working out the Hobbesian solution. We talked about Thomas Hobbes uh, and how he believed uh, absolute power, uh, and in his case, absolute authoritarian power, how absolute government tends to work out anyway, was necessary because human beings couldn't be trusted to, you know, stay <clears throat> within law and order otherwise. In an absolutist system like France, legitimate authority is based on will, which is another way to say it's based on power. Uh, you might say, well, that's always the case. Uh, well, uh, in the constitutional systems like the English, sort of our second uh, model here, uh, remember that the English kings. Uh, were trying also to achieve royal absolutism, but they failed. Uh, and so what they got stuck with, uh, though it was better for the people, was constitutional monarchy, uh, which means that the king does have to share power with other formal institutions. In this case, Parliament uh, in England was a huge roadblock for the uh, kings there to achieve uh, absolute power. Uh, and so they didn't. They end up having to share power, uh, which is what a constitutional monarchy is. The king uh, and the elected legislature uh, share power. Actually, there's an unelected part of the legislature, too. All three of them shared power. The English, then, uh, once it becomes a constitutional monarchy, are moving in the direction of a Lockean solution to government uh, questions. Uh, that A constitutional government means it is ruled by law. 
uh, not by the whim of just the you know king snapping his fingers, uh, but there are certain procedures and laws and, uh, and constitutional strictures that have to be uh, adhered to. In such a system, legitimate authority is based on reason. Uh, so it's not just based on, hey, the king can take power, uh, and so he has the right to. It has to be sort of, uh, it has to be not just legitimized, that's again something else. Uh, it has to sort of be based on something that can be seen as just, uh, right? So through the use of reason, it has to be proven uh, or established that this is just. Uh, now, sometimes, of course, power, will, and reason can coexist. Power uh, and uh, you know saying it's uh, and making it just can coexist, but uh, I still think it's a good way to contrast absolutism in France and constitutional monarchy in Great Britain. The two models uh, for uh, a potential uh, use by posterity, meaning future governments. Uh, you see a, a little graphic on the left there that I didn't create; I stole it. Uh, but uh, uh, the difference between absolutism and constitutionalism. Locke on sort of one side, Hobbes on the other. We didn't talk about Filmer, another one of the big names of the era. Uh, 